Hi, everybody. It's Brian Eisenberg, and I'm here with Juan Palacios, who is a baseball development specialist, as he likes to call himself, with over 30 years of experience working with pitchers and catchers and hitters. He's worked with some of the most talented MLB players, such as Carlos Correa and Francisco Lindor, Edwin Diaz. He was born in Puerto Rico. He's played in JUCO. He's played at an NAIA Division I uh, All-American team player. He's coached pitching staffs. Now he works with travel teams as well as he has his own facility where he's been teaching. He's also got an interesting background in that he is a both a personal trainer and massage therapist. And he really understands the body. But what I really wanted to bring him in today to talk about was I was fortunate enough to see him run a clinic here in Austin, Texas, where Sammy was able to, to be there as a kind of a last minute assistant for him because he needed another coach. This is during, during our crazy times the last couple of years. Yeah. But what's fascinating to me is I, I, I read this story about a player that you worked with, right? And from what I understand of the story is he barely played any showcases. He wasn't on the big PG or PBR, tour, none of that. Saw him, they told him they needed to work with you. And two years later, he's a number one draft pick for, for the San Diego Padres. Jackson, can, can you tell us? How that progression happened? Because I think that's the part the parents don't get. There's all kinds of ways to get where they want to go. Yeah. First of all, thank you for the invite. And thank you for having me and, and, and for your audience. And um, hi and hello and all that. Yeah, Jackson Mary was an uh, interesting story. So his dad uh, called me and I usually have a, a camp that I work with committed players. So when he came to Army, actually, he called me saying, hey, Juan, I get a short stop that is undersized. He needs to work on his hands. I, I cannot help him anymore. I need somebody professional to work with him and try to help him out and to, to be more aggressive. And uh, we make a, an assessment on him. So I say, yeah, I'm working right now with some guys like Jordan Giver that is with Virginia Tech right now, Josh Moylan, Kelly Bestas, you know, one of the top guys in the, in the, in the country right now, best hitters in the country and infielders. So I said, yeah, I just bring him so I can take a look at this kid and, and, and let's see where we're going with this. So they showed up, a really skinny guy, tall he was at, at the time, he was like six foot right there. He said, hey, he had grown like probably three inches in the last two months or whatever. I said, oh, I give him some, some swings to, to take and trouble like that. And then when we go into the fielding progression for that, I noticed that his hands were better at that age, at age 16, that Francisco Lindor and Carlos Correa. So I was really that's proud of that. It's just, it's just that sometimes you cannot teach that. That's something that, that players have naturally, especially D1 players and major league baseball players. That's what you're looking for, that, that coordination, hand eye coordination and that quickness. He slowed down the game this defensively so good that no play was a hard play for him. The footwork was there, hands was there. So I was like, um, all right, man, I'm going to charge you like 40 bucks for this clinic. But guess what? You don't have to pay me anymore because this guy is going to be a first round pick. And that was December um, 2020. Then we still, we, we keep working with him and he started growing. We identified some things that we needed to work with him, especially with the legs and the core. He needs to get bigger because he was a 7-2 runner. So we just hit the core really good, hit really hard the legs. And then after that, he became stronger, faster. He grew three more inches. So at the time that I got him, he was six foot, 145. At the time of the draft, that it was delayed because of COVID in yep. July, that helped him a lot also. He was 6'3", 195. So when you see that change, on a player, on power, on, on the fast, he was, he finished up running 6.5. So we wow. went from 7.2 to 6.5 in two years. I think that's, that, that's a pretty good number. And he started showing the power to all fields that, you know, that, that makes him uh, who he was on the, on the first round. So interesting question there that, that I want to explore deeper because a lot of people would think, okay, I can't be a D1 player if I'm not under seven second, 60 time. No. And obviously he was able to a little bit slower. Yeah. yeah. 
how does that happen? Like, even if I don't have the, the, the specific tools, how do people get to the levels they get to even when they don't have the specific tools? Well, remember that you, you need to have the hands. Hand and eye coordination is the most important thing for an infielder. And if you can feel and you can hit with power, you don't have to play, you don't have to be fast to play second base or to, third, uh, to play third base if you're a righty. Or if you're on their side, if you're like five, six, five, seven, five, eight, if you got the power, then they're going to find you uh, a position. Plus in this staying era that you know where the hitter is going to actually, you know, put the ball in play mainly 80% of the time and you got good hands, they will position you there. So you, the range is not an issue right now. That's why they're trying to avoid the shift in major league baseball, right? Because you got this power, second baseman and George stop that they're not fast, but guess what? They make the plays right now, plus they make a lot of damage offensively. So yeah, that, that was a really good question. So I know that one of the things that you talk about that I, I've never heard really talked about a lot is you said they have the instincts, they have the hand-eye coordination, but there's a lot of different progressions that they need in order to look like an elite infielder. And you have a specific number of them. It's not like an accident. It's like, oh, no, I'm going to have them just do this and that. And, and you make it as you go along. I think you said it's like 14 yeah, transfers I mean, between, or something between, like that. Between, between 12, 12 to 16, all depends on the here, on the infielder and what they need to, to work on. But we go in, into 12 to, to 16, basically 14 on different drills and progressions that we're going to have, right? Because those are the, the most common 14 plays that a middle infielder or a second baseman or a first baseman or a third baseman will, will encounter in games. And one of the things that have been really successful is that my infielders can go into an indoor facility after three months and go outside and be a really good infielder. So they transfer it immediately. They transfer it immediately. Yeah. It's not like, it's not like hitting that is hit or miss. Sometimes you work with a hitter two, three months and then it takes timing. It takes a lot of all the things to get outside on the infielders. If you get a really good progression and you work every day on the same place, muscle memory and, and, and just take it seriously, everything that, that you have to do. Then when you go outside, it comes to you really quick. So that's, that's been helping a lot of my players. It's interesting because when I see a lot of infield, you know, clinics out there or coaches, a lot of it is focused in on, okay, let's get the, get you down on the floor. Let's work the hands without a glove. Then maybe we'll go to a flat glove. Then maybe we'll go to, to standing up and then bare hand and then putting on the glove. And they think of those as just the progressions. And then they put them out in the field and good luck. No, that's, that is just a warm up uh, that like with, with Ron Washington or you see with, with, with Kinsler in, in San Diego, you know, yeah. just that, that is a warm up progression to get into it, to get ready, to get your eyes ready for the ball, to, to, to get ready for practice or yep. for a game. But that doesn't translate into a game. That doesn't translate for what you need to do on a game. That's, those are YouTube drills that you learn and you do it um, for, for, for fun or you do it just for warm up. But what about, you know, the different velocities that you need to have for progression? One of the, I, I start always with just regular ground balls. Then we finish with, we, we continue with backhand plays, mm -hmm. glove hand plays, of course. Then we're going to go with the separation on all three of them. Because what do you mean by that? after you catch the ball, you have to separate usually in the middle. And mm -hmm. I don't like the funnel a lot, but if you're an infielder that you have that. So we're going to go into the progression of those three. Also, then we're going to move into the double play feet, right? Like for the second baseman, I'm just going to give an example, because I got so many second base, first base, yep. but teaching from second base, then we're going knee down. Then we're going the, the flip, palm up. Then the other flip, palm down. Then we're going to have the, the other progression, taking the ball to, to, to the hole and then turning uh, 180 to throw the ball to second base. The slow roller, also the three progression for a, a slow roller, throw to first base, catching separation and throwing the ball to home plate. And then we finish up with just a really good backhand on getting the cross because with backhand, second base and shortstop, when the ball is hit hard, then you do the cross. Yeah. When the ball is here soft, then you got your right foot 
put it you know, around it. You have the time to to wait and then to make the throw based on that. So those are basically the 14, 16 things that we do with each individual. You know, because every infielder is totally different. The footwork is totally different. So you cannot try, you, you cannot have a second baseman do the, the footwork that they do with a, with a shortstop or a third base. And that's what I see a lot. When they go and work with the infielder, they don't treat them for specialized footwear or specialized drills or progression drills to get ready for the game. Or even in the showcases, for that matter, too. They'll, they'll put everybody at shortstop, hit them fungo at shortstop and see what their footwork like and evaluate them from there and not necessarily see what their specialized you know looks are. Yeah, showcase is totally different because they want to see how quick you are to the ball, how you have, what's your hand and eye coordination, plus... They don't care if you're effective throwing to first base or not. They just want to see that, that you can throw 87 miles per hour or more. So, so you'll be a prospect, right? So that, that's what they want. But they always play games and, and you get the chance to, to show or you show your value or to get exposed. So that, those are the two things that, that happen on showcases with a lot of people. Yeah. Absolutely. Obviously, now we just we talked about in, infield. And I hope parents understand that there's a real difference in having an understanding of all these progressions and working with someone who's going to work them through them versus just taking infield ground balls. When you're working with hitters, and, and I know you like to talk about your lab now as well. You have TrackMan, and you've got uh, 4D Motion, right, or KVest, and uh, you're using Pitch AI. You're using all kinds of technology, but also obviously the baseball skills, and, you, and you're really merging this together. What are you doing differently with hitters that – is not happening in most cages that parents should be looking for in a good hitting coach. The, the problem is that everybody treats the, the, the players the same. And every player, every swing is different. Every player has different skills that you can take advantage of, or you need to make the, the weaknesses, the stronger points for that. What I'm seeing is you go into a, into a hitting coach and I'm not blasting anybody. I'm not yeah, blasting yeah, yeah, anybody. No. You go to, to a pitching co a hitting coach and then he teaches the same thing. It's the clone. They, they clone every hitter. They want every hitter to do the same. And not every hitter is the same. For Christ's sake, I have seen people that work with professional players that they're teaching the same thing that they're teaching professional players to the 11 new players. And, and, and it, it's always, again, it's, it's always a progression of what kind of hitter you should be. Because in the lineup, if you're in the lineup for, a, for any high school or college program right now, and you don't have the ability to advance the runners to play the game or to know the situation, you know, what you have to do on every situation or every pitch, then you're useless. You're not going to, you're, you're going to be a bench player. Plus, you're not going to get to the next level because you cannot help your team. You're going to be on the bench. Even if you have a hundred mile per hour exit velocity. Sorry. If you cannot hit the ball. If you got men on, on, on first and second and you hit the ball hard 100 miles per hour to third base, guess what? That third base is going to catch the ball and it's going to do a triple play. Yep. So it's the same. I, I, I try to teach my guys work on the case the same way that they're going to have the same approach at the games. Practices is for you to get ready for games. It's not for you to, to get stronger. It's not for you to get faster. Yeah, there's center drills that you can do by hand and eye coordination and, and all that kind of things. But when a pitch is thrown to you and every round has to be different and every round has to be a challenge for the hitter making the same situations that they're going to face on games. And I see a lot of these hitting practices that they just throw, they don't throw curveballs, they don't throw changes, mm -hmm. they don't throw fastball. They only throw fastball right down the middle. Hit up all, Go gap to gap and, and then just hit where, where the ball is pitch. Yeah, and, and this is not – we're certainly not trying to beat up on, on, on hitting coaches or any kind of coaches. What, what I want to make sure I'm trying to communicate here is I, I didn't come from a baseball background. Like, I played recreationally my whole life. I played wiffle ball and stick ball and baseball in the park with my friends, but I never played formally. And if I needed to find a hitting coach, I want to know what it is I need to look for. Like, how do I know I'm getting my money's worth working with my kid or am I just spending the money and it's not necessarily translating to, to their game. And I well, think. There, yeah. There, there are three things, right? 
you had to have a, and I hate to use the same word, a progression, right? So you had to have a metric system that, that you're hitting the ball harder, that your swing is being quicker, and that your balance is being better in, in, in the zone. So that's the first thing. Second, your hitting coach should actually, if I just look at about your weakness, make a plan you know, to make those weakness better for when you go into the game. And then third, that hitting coach have to work with situational hitting, all right? And help this guy just to hit with power to all sides or just use the bat, just the, the, the hand and eye coordination again, the bat control. The bat control is the most important thing, to be honest with you, on a, on a game because you can have a changeover or a curveball or a fastball and you can actually go up or you, you can put it on the gap so you can do whatever you want with that, with back control. So those are the three things that I think that if you're not seeing improvement, if your kid cannot hit opposite field or he doesn't understand what being on the box means, then it's going to be a problem for, for everybody. Yeah, I see so much of it. And I don't spend a lot of time on it, but I see a lot of it of kids trying to show off for social media with their max exit velo and everything is just a you know quick turn and pull the ball. And then you, you try to see if they can hit opposite opposite field and there's just nothing there they've just got nothing because they've been training all the time just to hit max numbers yeah they the world the, the baseball world that we live in is the pitchers want to throw 90 and the hitters want to touch uh, you know, 100 that's what they want to see they don't care how to get there after i get there then i work on my game and i think it should be everything at the same time right you, you have to go to the gym your nutrition has to be uh, there your supplement has to be there and then your training has to be there. So if, if those four things are not aligned, then something is going to go wrong. And that's the way that I have seen it with the talented player that I have worked in the past. They have all something in common. Nutrition, the gym, their training, and the focus on detail on the game, offensively and defensively, is a plus. They're being successful in their career because of that. Now, you and I are not the youngest of men, but you, we tell by a little bit of... Oh, no, I, lo I love the white beard. right now. Yeah, I look like Christmas, yeah. You've been around long enough to know that not everybody is super talented. Yep. What are the guys who are not as talented? I, I say all the time, Sammy was not born an elite athlete. Not, not yep. by any stretch of the imagination was he elite, okay? Yep. Now he's finally got the skills where he can compete at... He's committed to a college. Yep. What do you do if, if your child's not elite athlete? And I'll is it work. the same four things? I'll, I'll work with everybody. Yeah, that's a formula. That's right there is a formula that you need to have if you're an alley or you, even if you're not an alley. If you just go to the gym to have fun, what what the physical tour is this? Do or what people who who just you know do uh, uh, cycling or they're swimmers. You know, baseball. When, when you're a baseball player, you're an athlete, and to be an athlete, those are the four things that you need to focus on to get better. We as coaches or as mentors right now, because we, we're getting old and now we, we're becoming, mm -hmm. instead of trainers and coaches, we're becoming more as mentors because we have seen a lot of things. We mentor the, the coaches, we mentor the players, and we mentor the dads. Yes. All right. So when you see that, you can make a, a D player, a C player, or a C player, a B player, or a B player, an A player. And sometimes you can do like Jackson, he was a B player, and then you can make it the, this, this superstar. But the discipline yeah. on those four things, nutrition, going to the gym, the, the outwork and practice and the attention to detail has to be there. It's there it, there's not the, it, one of those things is not there, then it will be really difficult for a player to get better. I'm going to pause it for a second. Okay, so we've talked fielding, we've talked hitting. Let's talk about pitching because that's the one I think we have a lot of fun with. I love watching all your videos of your guys with, with pitch AI, with, with the track man, some of the experiments you're doing with them. Yep. Again, you've got all this technology, but you've also come in to help teams like redo their pitching staff to, to perform yep. better as well. So it's on, on the field. What's your magic formula for making all of this work for pitchers? Well, the, the, the same approach, right? The same approach that I, that I have on hitting and, and the fielding, just helping them how to determine what the strongest point and the weakest point are during games. You, you can have a lefty throwing 68 miles per hour that you need to teach him a really good curveball 
having the, the great control, a little bit of movement so he can defend himself. But I got pictures that they're 17, 16 years old right now, throwing 92, that I need them to control that velocity and can throw strikes and can hit you know, the spots so they can be successful. But that's why I, I love the pro payout and I love the track man because the track man, they, they give you so much information on how they're using their body that when you learn about how the body has to be moving throughout the wind up or, or throughout the pitch or, or going to home plate and what muscle they need to move, what, le- you know, how the legs need, need to progress and the hip and shoulder separation and the finish, how, how they have to release the ball, what, how the fingers need to move, what they have to do. So it's, it's a lot of work. Pitching is something that is, is different because it all depends on if your shoulder hurts or, or how tired you are or how strong you are that day or how strong your legs are or how your mindset, how your breathing is also. The work on your breathing, work on your focus, on internal, internal focus versus you know, external focus. The, the pitching is so complex that you have to take everything individually by each case. And one thing that I have learned is data, right? It's a progression data. Again, you, you take the data that they have on the track man on proper AL, and then you, you start building from that and just trying to see what it works and we, and what doesn't work because sometimes you try to change something on a pitcher and goes completely wrong. They find the strike zone and they can, they don't have the feel for that pitch the way that you see it, and then we have to erase it. So when you go by field, you throw the pitch one, two, or three times. It doesn't work. Let's go back to the table. Let's go back and figure out what else we can do to make it better. So pitching is a completely, yeah, that, that's another beast there. But it's the most fun that we have, and we talk a lot almost every week, every two weeks. And we, like, the thing that I have, I love the clean fuego right now because that's been helping by using Clean Fuego, by using the, the proper AL, my pitchers have come from 62% throwing strikes to a 76% throwing strikes right now. Of course, we more the fastball because that's one of the things that I have introduced. Let's put a little bit of movement and let's use more the fastball because that's the pitch that you can control yeah. right away, quick, and you can spot that. And as a pitcher, if you don't know how to get out on fastballs, then you're not a good pitcher at all. You cannot be successful at any level if you cannot get out with your fastball. Yep, high, low, in, out. You got, you got, you got to know where to put that ball, and especially if you don't, if you don't have a lot of movement on it as well. It's been an interesting discussion we've been having the last few days. Would you rather see? And I, I think Marvin Freeman put it out as a tweet the other yesterday as well. Would you rather see someone who's 92 and, and, and straight, or or someone who's 86 but with a lot of movement? Yeah, it's, it, it, it all depends on the hitter also. If, I facing, if I'm facing a weak team that they don't have a big offense, that 92 guy with a, with a straight fastball will do it. But if I got kids, uh, a team that is offensively really good and, and they know how to move the runners, and then, then that 86 with, with the movement, that's my guy for that game. So all depends on who you're facing with. But yeah, every pitcher has strong points and, and the weakest point and it's all about us as coaches and trainers to put them in a position to succeed, not in a position to failure. So that's, that's what it makes this game so interesting. If you have one, one last piece of advice for parents out there looking to find a great coach for their son in, in either one skill or just overall the game, yeah. what, what would you tell them to look for? Progression. A, just find somebody who can show results. Find somebody that you can sit with him and make a plan, all right, and have a, a and have a, a really good a structured training towards your son, all right. No one, we have a lot of people that they love the quick fix, and they keep working two or three months on that same quick fix instead of going to a structured program to make him a better hitter or a better pitcher or a better catcher. And then make sure that they're working on to make them better on games. If that doesn't translate to game success, then they're wasting their time. I appreciate it. If people want to find uh, more about you and the type of things that you do, can you tell them where to find you? 
sure they can go into, into Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook as a coach131. And then my website, palaciosbaseballclinic.com, that I'm always around the, the nation. I'm going to be in uh, Detroit in, in a couple of weeks, and then I'm, we're going to Kansas. Last week, we were in Puerto Rico. So I'm doing a lot of traveling, a lot of training, and a lot of scouting. So so I'm having fun. I, I can't wait to go back to Austin, man. That, that was I, I, I hate to go to these places that they're so cold right now that <laughs> I, I want to get out of Maryland. And then I go to Michigan and say, it's what, oh my goodness, it's just too cold. Uh, Sammy's headed to school in Michigan. Like he says he doesn't mind the cold. I'm like, eh, let's, let's yeah, see what will. a full year of baseball <laughs> up there is going to be like. If you're indoor, uh, tell Sammy if he's indoor, he's going to be good. But when he has to run outside or throw the ball when it's 35 degrees, 40 degrees, because I think the rule that the college are using right now is if it is 40 degrees, then they're throwing outside. So I don't know that 40 degree outside with the wind is, yeah, it's, it's, it's not easy, but I, I know Sammy. Sammy's a really good player. And I know he will adapt uh, pretty good with that. So. Yeah. He was just in Baltimore a couple of weeks ago and he, he was out in shorts when it was 40 degrees. Yeah. When you're that big and, and, and teenager, you've got the metabolism. My age, I don't have it anymore. <laughs> Hey, uh, but thank you for having me. Like I said, always uh, here with you. I, I love everything that you're doing right now, all the research that we're doing. Uh, the spin rate with the fingers close and the fingers up. And, and we're doing a lot of experiments right now with catchers and with hitters that, that uh, we can update you in uh, like probably two months and, and see what's going on. Because I, I have seen with the high school team that the fingers being closer is been having a, a, a higher, better control on the spin rate on fastballs, all right? But when I did it with my guys at my clinics, because they were younger, they were not right. as developed features, 12, 13, 14, I didn't have that spin rate going up. So that's something that, that we need to discuss farther, but, but having the with the high school, you know, pitchers, having the fingers closer to the seam, closer, instead yeah. of being open a little Together, bit yeah. of the ball, the, the, the spin rate has been uh, uh, a lot better and faster. And you were right on that one. It's interesting because Sam, Sammy picked that up a little bit over a year ago. One of the former pros showed it to him because he was saying, hey, why, why don't you try it? And this was just a little after he started playing around with clean fuego. So he already yep. started picking up his efficiency, started picking up his spin. Then he got taught that. And then all of a sudden he started learning how to get that one scene pitch. Mm -hmm. And now every ball is this and that it goes in every direction. And, and he, he just becomes unhittable because you, you're looking for a ball to be right there in the middle. And the next thing it's on your hands. It's on your hands. Yeah. And, and that's because he's learned how to use that efficiency. And when you get that extra spin, it's hard. It's hard for hitters. For people that they don't know, if your if your fastball is twenty two hundred spin rate or more, then it's a seventy six percent that is going to be out. So that's what that's what they're they're looking for, and that's the metric that the major league baseball and college uh, division one players are are looking for. So, so just to get you some of the metrics that that you want to add, we we can do this another time. And when you are in my podcast. Then mm -hmm. we can discuss metrics and what, what are good metrics and what tables to use because people right now, they have a lot of like hitting machines, but they don't know that the hitting machine, the hit machine to, spin. to simulate 84 miles per hour had to be at 35 feet at 67 miles per hour. They don't know that. They just put it there and then, okay, if you, can you hit it? Can you? And, and they don't have that progression on speed to, to get them ready for games or if they're going to face a, a, a hot thrower, 90 miles per hour, where they need to have it to, to get it ready for that. So, Yeah, and, and if you want to face someone like Sammy, what I would highly suggest, I'm not, I'm not helping those who are out there, maybe with somebody listening to it and be like, oh, we're going to face that kid, we should do this. Take a whole bunch of baseballs with ripped seams yeah. and run those through the machine because they're going to move all over the place yeah, just the way his balls are. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly how, how it is. A lot of people, they don't know how... They haven't learned yet how to prepare the teams or the players or maybe your son to get better, that you can actually help them to get ready for that game. So.
Awesome. Juan, thank you so much for your time today. I know our listeners will appreciate it and hopefully we'll see each other soon. Man, thank you. Thanks to you and thanks for your audience and anything that I can do for any one of you, just, just let us know. We are always appreciative of all the time that you always put on, on this sport that, that, that needs the love right now. Thank you. All right. Hold on, let me...